male and female. This is what they said. Uh, not me. This is what they said in the in the legislative hearing. We cannot house male and female juveniles separately because then we would get lawsuits because we got to treat everybody equally. They are more worried about being woke than they're worried about young girls getting raped. Welcome, everybody, to another amazing episode of the Andrew Cooperwriter Show. Of course, I'm your host, Andrew Cooperwriter. Today, we've got some wonderful topics we're going to cover. Of course, a revival breakout breaks out at Asbury. Um, we hear a mix of opinions on it. I guess I'll give you mine. And uh, Bashir, reluctantly, uh, to a degree, signs the income tax cut We'll take a look at his message and why he vetoed this bill that this is based off of last year and what had him change his heart so much. Really shows the disgusting side of politics. And then finally, juvenile justice reform on the march here in Kentucky in one way looking to, of course, increase um, increase the amount of, I, I, I guess you could say, increase punishment for minors. Um, so they're not just getting slaps on the wrist when they do some pretty major things. But at the same time, taking a look at our juvenile justice systems, as we've had some huge problems over uh, the last year or so in our juvenile justice system. So we have all that here today on the Andrew Cooper Editor Show. Before we get into it, please hit the share button, like, comment, subscribe, tell other people about the podcast. Of course, as always, I appreciate your time, attention, your energy. I appreciate you guys uh, um, continuing to support us, support the podcast. Go on Andrew, the number four KY.com, Andrew four KY.com. Give to the old treasures campaign, because I tell you this much, we got to get some things right here in this state and in this country. I personally am tired, tired of having politicians, and elected people that we just can't trust. They're so dishonest. I'm tired of dealing with dishonest people. I know you are too as well. Let's make a difference. So please vote for me, Andrew Cooperwriter for State Treasurer. And please support the campaign, Andrew, the number 4KY.com. Okay, let's dig into it. First off, we've got juvenile criminal justice reform becoming quite a big issue this session. Um... First to understand, well, there's two there's two issues here. One is criminal justice reform, as far as making um, it where if you're if you are a um, minor and you commit certain crimes, that you're not just getting slaps on the wrist. Um, that bill is bill number House bill number three. So, a couple things in this bill. First, what it's doing is it's dealing with. Um, truancy as far as it goes, basically trying to address that if parents aren't getting involved in solving the, the child's truancy, not showing up to school issues. <coughs> and if there is not uh, enough parental cooperation, it, it allows a court designated worker, um, to make a finding and it allows the court to refer the case back to the designated work worker and order parental cooperation and to establish a pen penalty. Additionally as well, what it does is, is it requires children charged with serious felony offenses to be detained pending a detention hearing and to be evaluated for treatments, mental health treatments and everything else. It also makes it to where violent felonies, if they've admitted to it or have been found guilty of a violent felony for five years, that confidentiality does not apply. So right now you see people that are 16 years old, 17 years old, committing major felony, violent felony crimes, being found guilty. And the minute they turn 18, their records are sealed. So you've no idea that they just committed a violent felony felony a violent crime two years ago and that can be a you know expungement record expungement things like that that can be a big problem and so that's one of the things they're looking at uh, addressing and then also this bill addresses renovations at jefferson county youth detention center listen uh listen to this story this is crazy for those of you who are unaware what happened 
that Jefferson County Youth Detention Center was way over capacity. Way over capacity. And additionally as well, they were uh, housing female prisoners with male prisoners. They were, they were housing young female uh, 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 offenders with young male offenders together. You have a bunch of young adult criminals, 16, 17 years old boys, 16, 17 year old boys, and you're housing them, 15 year old boys, 14 year old boys, just young adult, young men. Or old boys, whatever you want to call it. At a certain point in their life, they're already proven to be violent individuals, a lot of them. And you're putting them at a time where they're going to be at some of their, one, their most aggressive uh, uh, because of how the hormones are flowing and everything else. And then two, sexually speaking, they're going to be most aggressive because of hormones flowing and everything else. And just, just the science. So you're, you're then, you have this pit of vipers, basically, and you're throwing these young women in. I get it. They're also criminals. I'm not saying that, but they still don't. No criminal deserves to have to face sexual assault constantly. And so, well, unless, it, well... Unless, of course, maybe they're sexual assault. No, no, no. But you're throwing these women into this pit of vipers. And when the... <laughs> I, you can't make this up. You can't make this up. When the Bashir administration was asked why they were housing male and female juvenile prisoners together they responded with I, I i'm not kidding i'm not kidding they responded with well we don't want any lawsuits what <laughs> as if we haven't been separating out male and female prisoners for like our entire history they literally sat there and said well we this is what they said in the hearing they said we cannot store store we cannot house male and female this is what they said not me this is what they said in the in the legislative hearing we cannot house male and female juveniles separately because then we would get lawsuits because we got to treat everybody equally they are more worried about being woke then they're worried about young girls getting raped. The Bashir administration. That is what they're more concerned about. That makes no flipping sense. It makes no sense. But they're more concerned about that. I, I, I laugh when I hear people say, oh, Bashir's so caring everything else. He cares more about paying homage to his woke gods then he cares about protecting young girls. But putting that to the side, Jefferson County Youth Detention Center, it's overflowing everything else. So what do they do? They have a riot. KSP has got to come in. They got to set that down. So they decide, hey, we need to make some renovations. We need to get this worked out. So we're going to spread these prisoners out. So they spread these prisoners out. And one of the places they go is out to Western Kentucky. Where there, in Western Kentucky, there broke out another. I mean, I mean, and, and, and when you say, well, what's the riots got to do with the overhousing and everything else? Because of the overhousing and because of the lack of staffing, they were not allowing them yard time. They're not allowing them time to, to out of their cells. They were housing them in their cells alone or in their cells, um, you know, with maybe two, three other people, whatever. But they were locked in their cells 
constantly not allowed out to roam or to the yard because of a lack of staffing, not because of the level of their crime, not as a punishment, but because they didn't have the staffing. They don't have the people. They don't have the facilities and way to safely let them out because of their failures, not because of something they did because of their failures. And so when they do let them out finally, and then they go to put them back, they don't want to go back. They start rioting. That's what has caused several of these juvenile detention center riots that we've seen over the last year or so. And so out in Western Kentucky, we see another riot. And during this time, one of the guards, um, you know, they, they, they don't have enough people to put it down. They're calling in KSP. They're calling in people to help. One of the guards is in the control room. He can't open the door because if he opens the door, the, the prisoners can, can gain access. They can open up the doors and escape and, and open up other cell doors and let out more people causing an issue. So he can't come out. He knows he can't. But he's stuck in that room. And while he's in that room, he sees and hears a young female being violently assaulted. He says one of the worst things in his life because he couldn't do anything to help, but he could hear it. He could see it. And it was awful. Here in Kentucky, that was a situation that was promulgated by these policies. Policies of not having enough staffing, policies by not having enough people, policies of, of not, f not prioritizing this correctly, policies of saying, look, we have to house male and female prisoners together. Something that anybody with a little lick of sense would say is wrong. But I guess that's what's wrong with so many of these politicians is they seem to have lost all of their sense completely, completely. All right. So moving on from that, Bashir begrudgingly signs uh, House Bill 1 this year, um, which is the tax cut bill. Understand here. So last year, the legislature passed a bill cutting our income tax from 5% to 4.5% and then created some new categories for sales tax. Despite the cut, despite the cut, um, sales tax actually, and, and sorry, income tax actually grew in revenues. And so we find ourselves in a position where, and, and how, how the legislature set up this bill. So their goal is to get us to 0% income tax. And so every single step of the way, we lower by half a percentage point when we hit certain markers of fund into the general fund. And, and you can go back in prior podcasts, I've really dug into this bill. But so at certain steps of the way, we get into this general fund. And then once they, they um, hit a marker, so r I believe we started out about 13 billion in our general fund account or 12.5 billion, I believe in our general fund account. Once that hits um, 13.5 or 14 billion, it was to be cut down by half a percentage point. And then next year, when it hits um, the next level of, of rating, so that would be, you know, if it hits, I, th I think it's 15 billion or so, then you get another half percentage point and it goes on and on. And we finally get to 0% once we hit 21.5 billion. It's a way to stair step down and move us to a consumption based only tax. Now, uh, I am for moving to a consumption based only tax. Um, of course, though, as I've discussed in prior times, I wasn't a particular fan of this bill because going from 13 billion to 21.5 billion in our general fund is a 70% increase in money. That means we have to have, um, uh, that means larger government, as, as many of you know. Um, I directly connect uh, the amount of money government spending to the size of government. And if you don't, you're a fool. Um, and I'm a Republican, so I'm a small government guy. So I want our government to spend less money because that equals smaller government. But moving forward to that, Bashir was against this bill, but he's against this bill the same way every all Democrats are. They are against regressive when in their words, regressive tax cuts. And what they mean is, is that income tax taxes the rich at a higher percentage and essentially the, the poor, less money makers, a lot of times will not uh, be paying a net amount of money into our taxing system. 
And a sales tax is very, very fair. And the Democrats don't like the fact it's very, very fair because it is based upon, quite simply, um, if you're taxing on things other than essentials, you, you the more you spend on non-essential items, the more you pay. So rich people, they buy a lot of stuff, they pay more sales tax. And then people who are of less means, they don't buy as much stuff, so they pay less sales tax. Okay? Just straight up. Straight up. And what we see with Democrats is they don't like that because they think, well, you know, the fair, the, the, the poor people are paying more in taxes uh, under this system instead of net zero. And we want to put it all onto the, the rich, basically, to pay all the taxes. Um, but they're also ignoring the fact that a sales tax taxing system versus an income tax is better and more accurate in capturing things. First off, they complain all the time about our current tax code, making it to people like Bezos. And, and of course, you know, they all complain about how much taxes Trump paid and everything else, how much taxes they end up paying. They complain about it with our current tax code. So because there's there's holes the size of a Mack truck to drive through in order to make it so you don't have to pay income tax. And there's not really a good way to address it. There's tons of holes and it's very hard to address because of the ramifications of some of them. For an example, for an example, um, if you own a business and it doesn't make any money, they don't want you to pay income tax. That makes sense, right? On that business, that makes sense. However, there's a lot of ways to make a business look like it doesn't make money. And so, and that's not illegal either. So you can't make that illegal. That's hard to do. So sales tax does a better job of both capturing the revenues off of, off of businesses and also as well, it does a better job of capturing revenues off some of the uh, illegal practices. Um, so people who are making their money um, under the table, people who, of course, drug dealers and things like that, that are, are leeching off our system, actually doing more than leeching off our system, using up a lot is, is they're awful and horrible. But then again, they don't operate a legal business, so they never pay taxes. Um, and so this could capture that. And then also to uh, positions that require self-reporting, waitresses, waiters, things like that. Um, you wouldn't have to worry about as much either. But Democrats hate this. They hate the idea that our taxing system might be fair and equal because they don't want it to be fair and equal. They want certain people to pay taxes and certain people not. I can't even say, like I said, I can't even say the most wealthiest because as they always point out, those people never seem to pay their fair share, whatever that means. What is your fair share of somebody else's stuff? I don't know. But the Democrats think they have it figured out. So, but Bashir last year when this bill passed, uh, this, this stair stepping down of sales tax replacing sales tax with income tax type process, he vetoed that bill. He said he didn't like it. But this year, the standalone bill to lower our sales tax that 0.5 percentage point down now to four, Bashir gleefully signed that into law. And let's take a look at the message he had while he was signing that in. Hey everybody, it's Andy. I want to talk to you today about my decision on House Bill 1, which should lower the income tax in Kentucky. First, things are tough out there. Inflation is real, and while gas prices have come down, uh, the grocery store bill is still way too high. Uh, while this issue is temporary, it's still going to last for some time into the foreseeable future, and our people need relief. Now, the best way to provide that relief would have been a reduction in the sales tax. A reduction in the sales tax for a certain period of time would have meant things that cost too much cost less. But the General Assembly refused to go that route. So what I'm faced with is a uh, bill that would lower the income tax that has some long-term repercussions for potentially funding state services, but would put at least a couple hundred dollars in the pockets of most Kentuckians at a time when they need it. What we just got was our revenue from January. And what I can tell you is our economy remains on fire. We had the best January in our history and the best January even for income tax, despite the fact it just went down. So right now, our economy can certainly sustain not just the decrease in the income tax that has already happened, 
but another one as well. And again, while there are some long-term repercussions, I have one bill in front of me, one bill about whether or not we can help our people at this time of high inflation. So today, I'm gonna to sign House Bill 1. That's gonna lower the income tax on Kentuckians. And I hope as we get through this period where again, groceries cost too much, that this helps everybody out there at least a little bit. Well, it is very clear um, he was channeling his inner Obama there, um, certainly and for sure. And I, I tell you what, I, I literally went right after he got done speaking uh, uh, and listening to that video, I literally went and looked up an Obama speech. And I'm like, it is like sounds exactly the same. Uh, the cadence, the way he was talking, that weird slowness, it's almost patronizing in a way. Um, it, it, it really shines through there. But he signs the bill, and as he says, and, th and this reveals a very gross side of politics, very gross side. He simply signed that bill because if he didn't, he would get a tax ad saying, Bashir refused to lower your, your taxes. That's why he signed that bill. Let's be very clear. There is no other reason. He does not believe in the bill. He doesn't care about the, this whole, well, maybe in the future we'll have these problems. He doesn't care about the future. I'm telling you this much right now. The only future he cares about is November of this year. That's the only future he cares about. You know how I know he only cares about that future? Know how I know? He's making financial decisions that make no sense to our future. He's just like his dad in that way. His dad spent untold amounts of money on infrastructure projects and then failing to fulfill our pension obligations at the same time, which leads us in a position now where our pension obligations are almost two to three times more than our state's GDP. That's how much our pension obligations are. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. He's worried. That's as far forward as he's thinking. That's as far forward as he's thinking is about November. And he knows that if he doesn't sign this bill, if he doesn't sign this tax bill, he will get those attack ads in November. So he's going to begrudgingly sign this. And he looks at it and says, well, this is a bill I got in front of me and it's my choice to lower your taxes or not. So of course I'm going to lower your taxes. You know, completely ignoring the fact that based upon what he said in his last time about this bill, he brought up the very real fact that the poorest of Kentuckians do not pay an income tax. He brought it up. He brought it up. He said it. And so now he's signing in an income tax and saying it's to help out our poor. Apparently, according to Bashir, they don't even pay an income tax. So what are you cutting? So he's admitting he, he, he has admitted in a roundabout way he's cutting taxes for the rich, according to him. But he's only doing it and he's trying to wrap it up in this cute little bow. But he's really doing it because he knows that if he doesn't, he's going to be held accountable for that in November. He's going to get the attack ads. He's going to get everything else. Which is a gross part of politics because you end up in situations where you have bad bills sometimes. But if you vote no on them, then you can be attacked as somehow anti this or anti that. One that Thomas Massey talks about is uh, there was a, a bill about reciprocity for guns, uh, concealed carry reciprocity. So, you know, if I have a concealed carry permit in um, Kentucky, then it carries over into any state. And he, but wrapped in that bill, was also a, a registry, a firearm registry, a way that you'd register your firearms with the federal government. And Bashir said... Bashir, sorry. Massey said, my bad, my apologies. And Massey said, I will not vote for a national gun owner registry. So he didn't vote for it. But of course he was attacked for not signing the reciprocity law. So he was called anti-2A when the bill was attacking the second amendment. And that's a position we find ourselves in in politics because once again, as I said at the top, Nobody is honest in politics. I am so, they're so dishonest and they're not straightforward. And part of it is because we have individuals that will take advantage of the fact our voters don't research 
and be able to cut things like this guy's anti this or this guy's anti that because they're finding whatever attacks they can find. And of course, the voter doesn't go and research and try to understand what the attack is, partially because it's hard to even understand what it is. But it's a gross part of politics and it leads to horrible situations. And that's why Bashir signed this. Not because he wanted to, not because he believes in it, but because he was forced to because of politics. Dig into it. We've got a revival breaking out at Asbury. It's been going on for about the last, um, you know, week and a half, two weeks now. Uh, as I understand it, Asbury's starting to wind it down, saying, look, we got to get these kids back to class. We got to get them in their classroom. I've heard a lot of opinions on this. Um, I've heard a lot of people uh, wonder, uh, is this a revival or it's not? I've heard some people um, poo-pooing, I guess you could say on um what's going on there and i've heard people really celebrating it and and i want to give you my opinions as, as many of you know i am a christian um i am um a devout christ follower as far as that goes i've myself came to know christ as a uh, young adult formally and officially I went to church growing up and stuff but uh, officially and, and formally knowing him as my savior um, as a young adult, um, I think I was, what was I like 19? I was 19. And so obviously as we watch what's going on at somewhere like Asbury, there's some skeptics, skeptics wondering, are they worshiping the Lord as we know them? Skeptics wondering, is this really a revival? Is it being played up? Is it just a, a social contagion and a long list of different concerns? In fact, I've even heard people talking about how um, some of these students leading in this revival are LGBTQ students and everything else and just generally bringing up issues. So first, I've got a couple thoughts. Here's my first one. Now, bear with me here. Okay. One, first thought is a revival, whether or not it, 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 it is a revival or it has a lasting effect. Well, you don't really know if time can, will only be able to tell. That being said. Let's call it a revival going forward. Of course, typically, like I said, revival is something you don't realize until you're looking back on it, probably, and realizing, oh, that was a revival of Christian thought here in America. So putting that to the side, but we're going to keep calling it a revival as far as that goes. Look, let's say you fall into the category where you're dubious over some of these things, and, and, and I understand why. I understand why, because let's face it, what's called spade a spade, um, there are certainly some churches, we see churches celebrating LGBTQ lifestyles, marrying gay couples, we see couple, we see churches changing around the doctrine, trying to kind of retcon the Bible. Also, we do see this push um, for this, this I, I, I guess I would call it, I see a confusion going on in some Christian churches, and they're confusing love for acceptance. Now follow me here, okay? My mother growing up <laughs> made it very clear that if I ever committed a crime, she would be the first person to report me to the police. Now, some people would say, some people would say that your mother didn't love you because she'd report you to the police. Some other people would say, no, there's a difference. See, my mother still loves me unconditionally, cares about me. But at the same time, at the same time, my, that doesn't mean my mother has to accept every single behavior I have. And what I see in, in, in modern day Christianity and oftentimes is a confusion of love and acceptance. Jesus loves us. God loves us. He sent his only son to die for our sins so that we may be led into the kingdom of heaven. However, that doesn't mean God and Jesus have to accept everything we do. So let's say... Uh, we have individuals here at this revival or, or everything else that are sinner. Maybe they're LGBTQ. Maybe they're having continual sin, premarital sex, all these issues. As long as they understand that God isn't saying that's okay because I love you. I accept everything you do. And it doesn't matter what you do. I accept that as good behavior and you will not see ramifications for that. Now understand this. Okay. Understand this too. And this is another common thing. Uh, God doesn't as much punish us as it is bad things happen because of a lack of God or Jesus. It, 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 it's not that God puts it in place. It's that we have free will and free choice. And that free will and free choice leads to, uh, if we choose not um, our creator, it leads to issues. 
So I'm saying that to say, as people are pointing this out, as long as we are talking about a God that says, I, I, I love you, I accept you, I'm your salvation, but at the same time has that firm hand of saying, an understanding of saying, but there is a way I want you to live. There is sin and it is not okay to just continue to sin, especially after you've accepted my authority over your life. It's not okay to do that. So if we're preaching the love portion, great. But if we're preaching acceptance of sin and it's okay and continue to live in these sinful ways, continue to have premarital sex, continue to uh, allow sloth greed to become your master, continue to allow uh, uh, LGBTQ type behaviors that are clearly uh, not in line with Christ's path. Um, to, if, if, if you continue to do those things and then somehow persuade yourself that God accepts that, you're mistaken. And we in the society so often we confuse love and acceptance. But let me get off my preaching block for a second. Let me ask this question, though, to those people who want to attack the revival. What else would you rather the kids be doing? I mean, just be honest here. Just let's be honest. we got a bunch of young adults. What would you rather they be doing? I would rather they be in church singing Christian songs and praying to God than be drinking or carrying on on the weekends. And so it's almost like it's, it's this begrudging kind of like, well, it's not the way I would do it, so I'm against it. And, and, and maybe it's not the way you'll do it. Or maybe you're like, I don't think it's revival, or these kids maybe really aren't into it, or they're just caught up in the moment. Let's say all of that is true. All of it's true. Would you still rather they not be in church? I mean, that's, that is my ultimate question when I see those naysayers, right? They can cast doubt on, on who's leading it or what have you. I hear you. But at the end of the day, even you have to admit, everybody should admit that where else would they rather the kids be at? Out drinking, making bad decisions. Where else would you want them to be? And I think, I think it is perfectly acceptable. For them to be at church, regardless of the reasons why, regardless of what, why they're being driven out there. I think it's perfectly acceptable they're at church. I think it's perfectly acceptable that they're, they're singing those songs. I think it's perfectly acceptable that um, they're digging into the Bible. I think that's all really great. And no matter what it actually turns out to be, and time will tell, I'd rather they be there than anywhere else. And I'm sure you'd agree. Well, guys, that's what we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening and, and joining in. And, and please share this out like this. Comment, subscribe, uh, uh, share this everywhere you can. And visit andrew4ky.com and check out the campaign. I appreciate you guys so, so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.